thank you all for being here. Okay. Uh, we made it. And we're here uh, to you know, attend presentations by the IQB students, 16. And I'm very excited. Uh, how about you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'm going to give the floor to the e-tourism group to talk about the uh, project with uh, the sponsor UI. Uh, thank you so much to NS and Professor Rowe for uh, all the help. They've been great uh, help. Um, yeah, and it's
But once we're able to get them on track, looking at the user interface and the icons and the flow of the application, we're able to gain valuable information on what they like and didn't like. And the surveys also gave us fantastic quantitative data to justify any of our choices when combining the user interfaces. And the first thing we found was that participants preferred the unsaturated reds, greens, beiges, and grays of the second color palette above. And when we were conducting the two color palettes, we decided to make them both unsaturated colors. This was because of the consistency between all applications that we benchmarked that used unsaturated colors. We then asked survey participants to rate on a scale of one to five how much they enjoyed each color palette. And as you can see, they were almost tied with a point, there being a point one difference in favor of the reds, greens, grays, and beiges. And then we asked focus groups what they thought about each color palette. And again, they agreed that the unsaturated colors looked mature and were pleasant to look at. But when they mentioned the reds, greens, beiges, and grays, they mentioned that it resembled the rock and flag, and they preferred it because of how it reminded them of Morocco. So the next thing we found was about the icons. Um, we tested two sets of icons on our, in our survey, and we had user interface one above and user interface two. And so what we found from the survey is that the participants preferred user interface two. Uh, in the survey, there was an individual photo of the icon and a statement saying, how much does this icon remind you of a blank function? And you had to rate on a scale of one to five, one being completely disagree and five being completely agree. So as you can see, um, user interface two is the dark blue bar, and that beat out user interface one in every category except there are some discrepancies that we found from our focus groups. So the first one, every category except for the managed settings. The, that is the first discrepancy. Um, in user interface one, we had the gear for uh, settings. In user interface two, we had the three dots for settings. So what we found on the survey was that the gear did score higher. But during our interactive prototypes, the, um, and for our focus groups, uh, the, peop the participants found that the three dots was more intuitive because it can mean manage settings um, and open a menu, whereas the gear just tends to mean settings. Um, the second thing we found was between the heart and the star. So if you'll see the star beat out the heart for meaning favorites in our survey. But in our interactive prototype, the heart was actually way more intuitive and uh, some of the participants were confused by the star for meaning you know, favorite a location. Additionally, for our logo, we found that users prefer simplistic designs that feature, uh, in this case, Dora Hassan. This, the following two logos were presented. One of each would match our user interface prototypes. The second one was selected by six out of eight members present in a meeting with UIR faculty. Uh, what was mentioned about the logo was the liking of the simplicity as well as the monochromatic design. We then brought it to a historian who mentioned that the ratio between the tower and the pillar sometimes made it hard to identify the monument. Um, we then brought it to a designer that mentioned that the monochromatic design would help the design be readable on top of different textures and colors. That's the case in our application, which is why um, we went with the monochromatic design. After that, we presented it to our focus groups, which were confused by the word, uh, by the transliteration of the Arabic word, uh, um, and then they mentioned that tourism might be easier to understand. We moved on to look at the demographics of the incoming tourists of Morocco, most of which speak English, French, and Spanish. The root of the word tourism for all three languages stays the same, which is why tourism was the most recognized in our focus groups. For the screen layout, it was found that users were often frustrated when functionality wasn't within one step of the main screen. Research shows that cutting down on the number of operations needed to get to a specific screen is key in the ease of use of mobile devices. For both of our prototypes, we found that users did get frustrated with the functionality. A lot of users would end up getting lost within the application if they had to go through multiple screens to get to the one screen that they wanted to. From this, we learned that we needed to make sure that all screens were accessible from just one step away from the main screen. Uh, also, from our focus groups, we learned that we should make the camera screen our main screen. A lot of participants found out that this was the main function of the applications that wanted it as the main screen. This ended up confirming for us that the convention that the main functionality of an application should also serve as its main screen. 
the graph that you can see uh, shows the average score from the focus group uh, based on how enjoyable the screen was. Uh, participants were asked to rate each screen on a one to five scale, one being the least enjoyable, five being the most enjoyable. Uh, each, uh, all the screens were rated pretty evenly across both user interfaces. So the way that we chose the inter user interface that we would use ended up being down to individual comments that are made during the focus group. Based on all these findings, we were able to create six recommendations for creating the user interface for UIL's application. And our first recommendation was to use the unsaturated reds, greens, beiges, and grays. We recommend this color palette because of the unsaturated colors, users preferred to look at it, calling it pleasant. We also recommend it because of the resemblance to Moroccan flag, reminding potential users that the app is for Morocco. Next, we recommend that UIR implements conventionally used icons. Specifically, we recommend these icons because users were able to identify the functionality of each of these icons within the context of the application. This allowed users to navigate that application without confusion or frustration. For the logo, we recommend that UIR uses a monochromatic color palette. This is based off of input from a professional designer. Second, we recommend that UIR uses uh, Torosan somewhere in the logo. This is because Torosan is one of the main focuses of the current application, and this is also based off of the input from a historian we worked closely with during our time here. Last week, we recommend that UIR uses e-tourism, e the English e-tourism, rather than the Arabic transliteration. This is based off of data from our focus group that said that e-tourism was more widely recognized than the Arabic transliteration. For the screen layout, we recommend that UIR uses the camera screen as the main screen for the application. We also recommend that all functions are one step away on this screen. As you can see, all three ways to search for a monument your favorites list, and managing your profile are all one step away on this screen. So next we recommend that during development of the app and the continuing development, uh, URI, UIR continues to um, conduct focus groups and surveys. So surveys because it's a good way to get qualitative data and focus groups because you can get dynamic feedback from people and see how potential users would use the app. Um, when you're in future development, when the application is done and has full functionality, a focus group would be much easier to conduct than our focus groups where we had to sit next to them and explain, no, the camera doesn't actually take a picture. It's just a mock-up. <laughs> um, and basically, you don't want to make all these changes to an application during development and then go and put it out on the market and realize that, well, nobody understands what this does and you want to make sure it's still intuitive to the demographic you're you know, marketing this to. Uh, finally, we recommend that UIR implements the final interface prototype. As you can see in the image above, this final interface prototype makes use of the four recommendations mentioned before. The color palette, the icons, uh, the screen layer, and the logo. Additionally, we believe that this final prototype better addresses the needs of our stakeholders and sponsors. We can see this when we run it against competitive value analysis. Uh, we ran this against our previous two user interface prototypes and calculated a 50 point increase when implementing our recommendations. This represents a 27% value increase in the product once uh, the recommendations are implemented. We believe that the implementation of this final user interface prototype our focus group templates and our um, six recommendations will make UIR successful at implementing and delivering a better user, user experience at Moroccan Heritage States. We, will, we would like to take this opportunity to thank UIR, WPI, and Professor Gogo for letting us participate in this project. Are there any questions? I did not. <laughs>
you identify the sites that were included on the app? Uh, so both learning community by and sponsor because we're go go right now. The two areas of focus are the Shabbat and our Islam. Uh, right now they're focusing on heritage sites in the Rabat Salah area. Hello everyone, it is such a pleasure for us to have all of you here to support our project advocating for people with disabilities. It has been a long journey so far and finally we can proudly say that not only us but all of the teams here have greatly achieved their goals. My name is Marina Tomo and I'm a chemical engineering major. My name is Leila Busama and I'm a math major. I'm uh, Chris Hartford and I'm a civil engineering major. For us, experiencing not only the culture of Morocco, but also the hospitality that all the people offer to us, made us even more motivated to successfully complete our project. Everyone has been so helpful when it comes to scheduling interviews, participating in our focus groups, and even just having a simple conversation about what it means to have a disability in Morocco. However, it'd be impossible to realize this project without the help of our sponsor, Dr. Azadeen Ibrahimi. He's the director of the BioNova Research Center, head of the Biotechnology Lab, and a professor at the Faculty of Medicine and Pharmacy of Rabat. Uh, similar to us, he was excited to work with us on this project because he wanted to make a positive impact on the community, specifically in the medical school. So, before we go any further, I want to start with a simple question. How do you define a person with disability? Anyone? Yes? And what do you think are some of the areas that they are most disadvantaged? Yes? What about sectors in life? Yes? Anyone else? Healthcare? Yeah. So everything that you say is correct, but just to have a clear definition, according to United Nations, people with disabilities are those who have long-term physical, mental, intellectual or sensorial impairments that hinders their full participation into society. And in Morocco, people with disabilities are disadvantaged in three important areas. Education, healthcare and employment. Our the project focuses on education because lack of education leads to future unemployment, 
resulting in lower income levels, which directly affects one's quality of life. So around 73% of all Moroccans with some sort of disability have never attended school, and only 15% have graduated from primary school. That percentage is even lower if you live in a rural area compared to an urban, and it's even lower for women with disabilities compared to men with disabilities. So these aren't just statistics, but they have a much deeper effect on society than you may think, and there are a couple reasons as to why um, Moroccans with disabilities have limited access to education. The first is the inability of school facilities to physically accommodate a student with a disability. So not all schools have ramps, elevators, or accessible signs which makes the school accessible. The second is the um, lack of adequately trained special needs teachers. So students don't just have physical disabilities, they can have developmental or learning disabilities, and teachers need to be trained with specific curriculums. And the last is um, the segregation from the rest of the students because of the stigma of having a disability in Morocco. So for us it was very important to work on a topic that would increase the accessibility to education. That's why our main uh, goal of the project was to provide recommendations to the Faculty of Medicine and Pharmacy here in Rabat on ways on how to increase the accessibility of their faculty. Even though we have focused in only one school, we hope that our project serves as an example to other schools in the area. So to do this, we first assess the current accessibility state of the faculty, and then we try to understand how accessibility issues were tackled in Moroccan context. And finally, today we are providing a recommendation to you and the faculty on improvements to increase the accessibility. Um, using American Disability Act standards, we were able to complete an accessibility audit of 11 different rooms at the school. Uh, some of the most frequented rooms we evaluated were the library, cafeteria, classrooms on the first and second floor, labs, and amphitheaters. Um, so this audit allowed us to investigate different features of these rooms, such as doorways, ramps, surfaces, and bathroom stalls. Um, this gave us information about what improvements need to be made in which areas. We then organized a focus group with students from the school, uh, interviewed with organizations, and a student with a disability. These interviews gave us uh, information of people who work closely with uh, people with disabilities, and we used this data to brainstorm recommendations and effective methods to improve accessibility in school. So based off the data we gathered from our methods, we um, categorized our findings into three main categories, navigation, space accessibility, and services. Navigation refers to how a student gets around the school. So the first picture is a photo of the main entrance. As you can see, there are a lot of stairs. In walking around the campus, there are even more stairs. Um, the labs at the school are on the third floor, and there's no elevators up to the third floor, which makes it difficult for someone in a wheelchair or someone who has trouble walking to get up there. Now, classrooms can be moved to accessible rooms, but labs cannot because of the amount of equipment and chemicals within them. Um, we also found that there are ramps around the school, but not all of the ramps meet ADA standards of being no more than a 1 to 12 slope. The ramp in the second picture, for example, is a 1 to 5 slope, making it too steep for someone real sure to get up, and there are no railings on the sides, making it a little dangerous. So, another important issue that was brought up to our attention was the lack of a school map that highlights the accessible areas and the places within the school. There is a well detailed map of the entrance, uh, at the entrance of the school with classrooms and spaces, but unfortunately it doesn't indicate the handicap sign. So adding, informa adding accessibility information to the campus map would be beneficial not only, for example, for a first year student to get to know the campus paper, but also if it was an online map, online applicants could see beforehand how accessible the school would be. Even if uh, the pathways are accessible, people with disabilities might still have a difficulty if the inside of rooms do not accommodate for their needs. From the accessibility audit, we found that some of the door handles to the amphitheaters were not easily operable, being that a hand force was needed to open them. Also, the entrances to the amphitheaters were in the back with stairs leading down to the front. Uh, that makes it so someone with a disability can only sit in the back of the room. Also, desks and chairs tend to be too low, which made it difficult for someone to transfer out of their wheelchair and into the desk chair. A positive fi finding was that the doors to the classrooms, labs, and the library did not close immediately, and this allowed someone with a disability enough time to get through the doorway. So not only should a student be physically accommodated for, they should be provided with services that help make their school experience um, better. 
So there are around 87,000 students in all of the Muhammad V University, and 790 of them have some sort of disability. So we did find that there is a center for accessibility that belongs to all the Muhammad V University, which means that all the faculties within the university can contact it if they have a student with a disability. So we found that um, if a school does not contact the center, that there is little the center can do to help them. Now the center helps students with things such as scheduling accessible classrooms, extended exam times if needed, and even helping them with future employment opportunities. Um, so if the school does not contact the center, it is up to the individual peers and professors to help out the student. The first picture is a photo of a ramp made for one student with a disability at the Rabat Medical School um, made by their peers. So to improve all these issues, we have come up with important recommendations to increase the accessibility of the FNP Rabat. First, we recommend for the school to implement ramps in front of the main buildings and at the main entrance of the school, such as cafeteria, library, bedrooms, or amphitheaters. Uh, as a short term, these ramps can be portable, metal, or wood wheelchair ramps, as shown here in the picture, we, which are not very expensive or not very uh, hard to be made. Uh, secondly, if there are ever to be major innovations, like if a new building is built, we also recommend that the elevator should be installed, so for example, labs in the third floor or student administration can be easily accessed. Also, accessibility signs should be indicated on the campus map. So we have provided an example. We have uh, used handicap accessibility sign in the areas where we found that there are ranks or the, there are accessible buildings. We also suggest that this map to be posted on the school website. And uh, finally, not only a school map will be beneficial, but also putting signage around the school to show directions. For example, uh, this is a handicap accessible bathroom would also be very beneficial for the students. Um, we recommend that the school improve the space accessibility of their facilities. It is necessary for every classroom to have one to two elevated desks with a removable chair, so someone with a disability can comfortably sit in the classroom. Uh, there should be railings near all handicap accessible features, such as ramps, desks, and bathroom stalls. And all door handles should be easily operable, so um, to allow for safe exiting and entering in case of an emergency. And if future renovations to, were to be made, we recommend that the school um, install automatic doors that open with a push button to allow someone with a disability to easily get through large doorways. So we then recommend that the school improve their student services for students with disabilities. There, we recommend that the school have someone in their um, student affairs office to directly assist students with disabilities. So this designated person would work directly with the Center for Accessibility and the students to raise awareness of the center and also assist the student with things like changing classrooms, getting extended exam times if needed, and helping them with future employment opportunities. So having someone in the Student Affairs Office to directly work with students with disabilities would not only be beneficial for students who have disabilities, but also if a student were to ever be temporarily injured, we'd want the school to respond in a quick and timely manner to get them the accommodations that they need. We also recommend that the school have a school psychologist, not just for students with disabilities, but for all students and teachers at the school so they can um, maintain psychological well-being and social health. We then recommend that the school um, encourages students to volunteer to help students with disabilities. So we have a similar program at our own school where students can volunteer to take notes for someone in a class who may not be able to. So having a student do this, they would be connected at the beginning of the semester and they would work together throughout. And this would create a more supportive learning environment for everyone. So the FNP Rabat is a higher educational institution which is continually improving its environment to make it fully accessible for uh, students who are pursuing their studies. Our project identified accessibility issues and recommended solutions that will somehow increase their accessibility. Um, the school's administration and faculty is aware of these issues and is always welcoming students' feedback as a catalyst to improve the accessibility. So the recommendations before were just some beneficial actions that the school uh, could take to improve students' overall experiences. The faculty's commitment is evident from hosting our project, but also from the current project they are undertaking. The faculty is currently building three new amphitheaters, 
where accessibility standards are taken into consideration and in the future, uh, students with disabilities can easily access the amphitheaters. Um, now we'd like to thank our advisors, Professor Robertson and Zali, for guiding and aiding us throughout this whole uh, process. Our sponsor, Dr. Ibrahimi, for giving us his full support and motivating us to complete this project. Um, the four students, Abdella, Nihal, Sophia, and Dua, for um, contacting people to interview, getting participants for our focus group, helping us with translation and familiarizing us with the school. And then all the people who have participated in our focus group and interviews, especially Yassin, for giving us insight on his personal experience. Um, so now we would like to close with a quote. It always seems impossible until it's done. So even though it is a small step, everything starts with a small step, but this small step can mean something very important to someone in it. So let's all treat this project as the first, as the first small step towards something great. Thank you. Questions? guideline that's why we use the American Disabilities Act standard and also there are not like international guidelines for different countries in Europe but like from other previous projects like around in Europe or in different schools we saw that they also use the American Disabilities standard and these standards they just say that the handle of the door should be operable or the ramp should have this width and this length Yes? I'm curious what uh, kind of responses you received when talking with different groups about disabilities and accessibility. Um, do you find that it's something that Morocco kind of broader is thinking about, or is this a new idea? So talking to people, it seemed like um, it's, people are starting to be more aware of this issue and they are starting to do more things about it. So interviewing people, um, they were very open to like our suggestions and they were even like, commending us on how great this project we are doing is. And uh, also, uh, even though they are aware of uh, the accessibility issues or like uh, the challenges that people with disabilities face, they always think that they need more motivation to work like on a specific project or they need someone else to do the first step and then they will, and then they will take an example of that first small step. And also like uh, during uh, the interview with our sponsor and the school, they said like, like all the other schools, if they see their project, they will start working towards something similar like that. some brochures which are on this table like for the recommendations so everyone in the end please feel free to get one brochure it's like a small guideline for the schools to use thank you Association Janat, a local NGO in Rabat, to complete our IQP project entitled Supporting the Fight Against Cancer, where we aim to improve the marketing and fundraising operations for Association Janat. 
Now during this presentation, we're going to begin with a bit of background information and describe the project opportunity. We're going to introduce you to the three objectives we took to complete our project goal and finally present our deliverable. But first, let's meet the team. Hi, I'm Lucas. I'm a mechanical engineering major. I'm Kate. I'm a chemical engineering major. My name is Fuka. I'm a bio biotech major. And I'm Sydney and I'm an industrial engineering major. Alright, so arguably cancer affects everyone across the world. This disease transcends geographic, cultural, and economic barriers. And in Morocco, breast cancer is the most prevalent. A lack of knowledge in regards to risk factors and preventative practices often lead to late stage diagnosis for these women. This can be due to a reluctancy to discuss the disease due to stigmatization and by the cultural belief in herbal remedies as opposed to modern medicine. Now, with a cancer diagnosis, there's always an economic commitment. And in Morocco, chemotherapy can cost as much as 1.15 times the annual minimum income for a Moroccan citizen. And with only approximately a third of the population with access to health care insurance to aid in this funding, this can prove an economic burden for cancer patients and their families. Now, when seeking cancer treatment, Moroccan citizens can face significant obstacles. The first is having to travel far distances to large cities such as Rabat to receive adequate cancer treatment. Although Morocco has made strides in this area of development, many hospitals still don't have the infrastructure in place to support the patient capacity and various treatment options. This can incur additional financial strain in the form of traveling and accommodation costs, and this can make it hard for a patient to make the journey nonetheless be able to bring their biggest support system, which is their families. And in Morocco, family is at the center of every person's life. And when going through cancer treatment, they can be their biggest support system. So it can be difficult to have to have this time away from their family due to these different costs. And as Afra mentioned, there is a stigma surrounding breast cancer. Often referred to as the ugly disease, patients can be reluctant to discuss that they have it and create that support system in lieu of not having a family member. The support system can be in the form of other women that have the disease or other family members in support of them. Now fortunately, our sponsor, Association Janat, has been able to aid, help these women and provide the support that they need, and we just will introduce you to them now. Thank you, Kate. Our sponsor, Association Janat, uh, provides free food, uh, accommodation, pain management, and transportation to and from treatments for over 10,000 patients every year, as well as psychological help and uh, leisure activities during their stay. Uh, founded by cancer survivor, Ms. Khadija El Korti, out of her own home, Janat can provide for up to 30 women and 15 men at any given time in Khadija's house and in two nearby rental apartments. Khadija first opened her home in 2009, but Association Janat was not an officially recognized association until 2016. Up until that point, Khadija relied upon her late husband's pension and in-kind donation to support her patients and upon word of mouth to spread knowledge of her organization. Our project is to create a marketing guide and fundraising plan to improve operations for Association Janat by raising their visibility. If we can raise their vis visibility, we can increase the number of donations they receive and help them with their financial struggles. In order to achieve our goal, we broke it down to three objectives, which were common in detail. So our time in Rabat, uh, we completed three objectives and we completed them in order so that it would be more successful and more feasible for the organization. So our first objective was to develop an understanding of uh, marketing and fundraising in the Mor uh, Moroccan context. Our second objective was to assess Association Gymnast's current state of marketing and fundraising. And our third and final objective was to create a social media marketing guide and a fundraising plan for Association Gymnast. So to talk in more detail of our first objective, uh, we developed an understanding of marketing and fundraising in Moroccan context. To do this, we conducted semi-structured interviews with NGOs in Morocco. Uh, with, we conducted semi-structured interviews with various people. Um, one of these people were NGOs in Morocco. We did this in order to better understand how NGOs function in Morocco. Then we moved on to interviewing NGOs that are similar to Association Jannat so that we can better understand how NGOs that have a similar mission to Association Jannat succeed. Later we moved on to conducting semi-structured interviews with experts in Moroccan marketing and fundraising so that we can better understand how marketing and fundraising properly works in Morocco.
After completing our first objective, in about two weeks, we moved on to our second objective, which was assessing Association Gymnast's current state of marketing and fundraising. To do this, we again conducted semi-structured interviews with various people. Uh, the first person that we interviewed was our sponsor, Abdullah Sasawi. Abdullah Sasawi is the current general uh, manager of Association Jannah, and he has the most information about the current state of marketing and fundraising. And naturally, we asked him questions about the current state of marketing and fundraising with Association Jannah. Uh, later, we moved on to interviewing Association Jannah residents. Overall, we interviewed four residents. However, these interviews were more chat-like in order to make them feel more safe rather than more scared. And after completing our second objective, uh, we completed our first objectives in around a month. We moved on to our third and final objective, which was creating a final deliverable for the association. Uh, overall, we created a social media marketing guide and a fundraising plan for Association Jannah. To do this, we first analyzed all the data that we gathered from our first two objectives, which were majorly interview data that we gathered. Then we created a social media marketing guide and a fundraising plan for the organization. After doing this, we presented all the data that we gathered for the guide and the plan to our sponsor in a special meeting that we did, and then we taught them uh, how to apply the information that we gathered to the association so that they can become more visible to the public eye as well as uh, become sustainable for the future. To further detail this deliverable for Con just introduced, we were able to break it down into three steps that our sponsor could follow to most efficiently and successfully complete this plan. So the first step deals completely with brand development. For this step, we recommended that they first really understand who the organization is as itself, what its identity is. So we ask them questions like, what's your message, what's your mission, and what are your goals for the future? And this will be able to be extremely helpful for them once they are able to identify their target audience so they know what they want to convey when we move into the next step. We also recommended that they perform a SWOT analysis of their organization so they can better understand their strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And lastly, we recommended that they create a portfolio that catalogs all the important events and achievements of the organizations that can further reference it in the future during their social media posting. This moves us right into step two, which focuses completely on social media. We recommended to them that they own a social media account on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And for each of these platforms, we're able to give them content tips such as what to post, what to put in their captions, and what kind of video and picture content to include. This includes testimonials from the residents, this can include something as simple as statistics about cancer in Morocco, as well as just things they do on the day-to-day -day basis like group dinners and group Quran meetings in Association Jeanette's main building. We're also able to give them some strategy tips as well for each of the different platforms we recommended to them. So first, in this example, you can see, yeah, there we go, uh, you can see that this is um, some example Facebook posts, and not only were we able to give them examples of posts from other nonprofit organizations, we were able to give them specific reasons why they should also be using some of these strategies as well. Some of these include writing their captions both in Arabic and in English so they can reach a broader audience, as well as using hashtags and also putting quality photos in their posts as well. In the second example we have on the screen now, they also have a really informative and moving article that tells their audience more about the organization. For Instagram, we have an example of a caption here that not only includes their location as well as a lot of hashtags, it also tags another organization that they worked with, uh, that they mentioned in the picture that accompanied this post. And this is able to create an opportunity for networking that they might not have had in person, but they can now create online. And then below it, we have some examples of informative profiles that when anyone searches associations or not, they know their name, their slogan, their logo, a description of them, and maybe a link to other social media accounts or a website as well. We also have tips 
for Twitter as well. On top, there is an example of an informative profile again with their slogan, a really great picture that kind of looks into what the organization stands for and their values, and then it has a brief description as well as a post below. Twitter, we're recommending that they use mostly for updates and announcements of events and things like that just to keep them in the back of their mind of their target audience and their followers. And in this post specifically, they were able to use hashtags, tagging, uh, as well as an informational video. Through our research, we were able to discover that pictures and videos are what's going to draw people to posts. They're more likely to stay on the post, read the post, figure out what it's about if it includes a visual rather than just words. And then lastly, with our recommendations and tips for LinkedIn, this is what's going to be able to give Association Janam more of a professional view in the eyes of their audience. And so in order to take advantage of this professional view, it's really important to have a really informative about section. So here's an example of a Moroccan NGO that we spoke with. This is their about section on LinkedIn. It not only includes a detailed description of their organization in Arabic, it also includes in English, as well as how to contact them, their location, their website, and then a list of skills to let other people know what they stand for, what they do, and what they're capable of. Lastly, in our third step, it goes into future steps that we recommend the association take after they've created a really concrete presence and reputation online. And that first deals with networking. And that's making relationships and emotional connections with other organizations in Morocco, other individuals that really believe in their cause, and then later moving on to making a more international networking online. This also deals with using their own resources as well, in this case it's the women, and having the women spread the word about associations or not to other people they meet during their treatments at hospitals, or their friends and family at home. And since these people have to travel from so far to stay at associations or not, it's a really easy way to spread the word throughout Baraka. And lastly, we were able to give them some information about grants, what that process would look like when they do choose to apply for them, and what to expect uh, to hopefully reach their ultimate goal, which is to increase their funds for the organization. Now we'd like to take some time to thank all those who have helped us during our project. Firstly, we'd like to thank our advisors, Professor Laura Roberts and Professor Mohamed al Hamzali, without whom we would not have achieved what we had this term. We'd also like to thank our sponsors, Ms. Khadija El Korti and Mr. Abdel Sassali of Association Janat, for giving us such a wonderful opportunity to help. We'd like to extend our special gratitude to Mr. Adil Arani, whose work as our interpreter went far above and beyond anything we could have expected. We'd also like to give a shout out back home to WPI to Professor Leslie Dobson for getting us cultural background for our project, and to the WPI marketing team who educated us on marketing and social media. We'd like to thank uh, the members of MSIS, Enactus, and SimSim organizations whose information during interviews was extremely enlightening and helpful. And lastly, we'd like to thank IS Abroad for being such gracious hosts during our stream. Because they just 
think it's an automatic death sentence, they don't really know a lot about it. Um, so I think that increase in knowledge and learning more about it would be able to lessen that stigma. Yeah. <laughs> so a similar question about fundraising, and that it's not, it's my understanding anyway, you can certainly correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a, a, a different history of fundraising here than there is in the United States. So I'm curious how you are kind of approach that as well, and, and I'm assuming that's ultimately a goal of the campaign. Uh, yes, certainly. That's why we made uh, more of an emphasis on grant writing than sort of the crowd fundraising that you see most commonly in the States. Crowd fundraising here is not as common, we learned that very on early on in our project. So we heard from our interviews with the other organizations that most of their money comes through grants and applying for grants. That's why we made the emphasize, like, emphasize after they've completed sort of the social media aspects, they can use that added visibility to help them gain grant money. We are the trust in Moroccan institutions through creating a visual narrative team. We are Haley Campbell, Sarah Ewer, John Malay. Moroccans have adopted a don't know, don't care mentality towards politics due to a history of constant turmoil and corruption in the government. However, in 2011, Morocco underwent constitutional reforms and became a growing democracy. Despite the reforms, civic engagement remained low within the country. Citizens refrained from participating due to Sorry. Citizens are free from participating due to a lack of interest and accessibility to information and um, general mistrust of the government. So the overall goal of our project is to assist our sponsoring agency, the Moroccan Institute for Policy Analysis, in creating a visual representation of their newest trust, in trust index research to help their data reach a wider audience. To accomplish this goal, we worked through a few objectives, the first of which being to make sure we really thoroughly understood our sponsors' research and scope so that we could accurately portray them in any media we produce. The second being to gather information on our target audience, things like where they gain their political news, what forms of media they use, things like that, so that we can most effectively connect with them. And lastly, actually creating this easy to understand video to help the data reach a wider audience. So uh, we worked with the Moroccan Institute for Policy Analysis this term. Uh, this is a research institution and think tank that works on creating policy papers in Morocco, as well as putting on events and trainings to help further civic education and discussion within the country. Specifically, our sponsor is Dr. Mohamed Mazba, the director of the institute and author of several of their papers. So going back to our first objective, we mentioned really wanting to make sure we understood their research and scope, which we began in our preparatory term by going through some of the websites and speaking with our sponsor himself to gain a little bit of knowledge on what the Institute does. Once we arrived in Rabat, we went even further into this um, by reading some of their most recent reports, annotating them, looking for areas we could visualize, 
and what would be most effective, and eventually we settled on working on their new paper, the Trust and Institutions Index. Now, the Trust and Institutions Index is MEPA's most recent paper. It has yet to be published, and it is a collection of statistical information about who Moroccans trust, uh, in particular, who if they trust uh, elected or non elected institutions. For example, we have up here uh, the trust in parliament, government, and political parties by um, percentages. Uh, it, the data was gathered by, interviewed by a survey in a thousand Moroccans who accurately represented the demographics of Morocco. So for example, if you had uh, half of the men would be among the 1,000 survey and half would be women. Uh, another uh, example would be, uh, another example is up there, the parliament and the, polit the parliament, government and political parties. Uh, we ended up choosing this over some of the other um, articles such as the Uber article, uh, in particular because we thought that it would be it would inspire Moroccans' curiosity to look further into some of these institutes and to wonder as to why the trust is so low in certain institutions and why others garner much more trust. After we decided on our um, on what we would make the subject of our video, we began our video production by brainstorming how direct how we would directly uh, engage the audience via creating a theme. Ultimately, we were inspired by the thousand uh, Moroccan survey that accurately represented their demographics to create the theme of if, Mor if Morocco was distilled down to 100 people, who would they trust? After deciding on this theme, as we felt it was more engaging, we began to storyboard. Uh, we took that, uh, we used uh, presentation slides in the same sort of way uh, in order to storyboard. And uh, we used it to visualize how the video would look overall, as well as how the slides would correlate to the script. And ultimately, after we were done with our preliminary storyboarding, we continued on to video creation and video production, in which we uh, began animating and illustrating, which was the bulk of our project. Um, we used Adobe Illustrator and Inkscape, and Inkscape to create uh, vector images and digital art. Afterwards, we used Adobe After Effects to animate these visuals. And finally, we used Adobe Premiere Pro to edit together both the uh, animations as well as music, voiceover, and additional uh, interviews. Our videos contain easy to understand animations and a voiceover in English that will later be translated to Jerusha. The animations were chosen and created carefully to provide a simple yet understandable explanation of MEPA's trust index. By using these features, more Moroccans will gain access to MEPA's work. Our, first, er, our video that we made focused on general institutional trust in areas such as the armed forces, health, and education. The final video is six minutes long, and it features Mipo's brand aesthetics, such as their logo and color scheme. We also began the production process for two additional videos, the second being on social trust, and the third on trust in Parliament. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, we were unable to finish the production of these videos. We also created recommendations for our sponsor, so that in the future they will have a better and faster experience when producing the videos. We will now show a clip of our video. It will, it's a sample so that we have time for questions in the end. And unfortunately, we have some minor technology issues, so it might be a little quiet, but we'll do our best. All the world work if no one trusts them in institutions. If people don't trust the health sector, they may not seek treatment when they're sick. Without trust in education, people may not learn important information and may even leave school entirely. If people don't trust the armed forces or police, they may not. Trust is 
the foundations of which our society is built. Our schools, our stores, our homes, and our governments are legitimized only by a collective trust in them. Without trust, institutions will lack the power to govern, and families will lack the connection that binds them together. The study of trust allows us to understand ourselves better and suggest alternatives to fix the shortcomings of trust in communities. The Moroccan Institute for Policy Analysis completed a study that measures Moroccans' level of confidence in various political and economic institutions called the Trust in Institutions Index. When dozens of Moroccans were surveyed and deemed representative of the nation. From the data obtained, we can scale in the population to get an interesting view of the people. Currently, Morocco has a population of about 35.7 million. But what if it could be represented by just 100? So, the reason why we choose this methodology is to have a scientific uh, answer to how Moroccan trust and uh, having quantitative data we have asked to understand the perceptions of Moroccans over the issue of trust in the institution. There would be 50 men and 50 women. 31 people would be between the ages of 18 and 29. 22 would be in their 30s, 18 would be in their 40s, and 29 would be 50 years or older. It would be a geographically diverse group, 17 from the north, 18 people from the central region, 37 living in the Atlantic region, and 28 from the south. That's how the 1800 Moroccans would look at them. Now it's just a short, quick of our video, it's rather long, so we're going to do our presentation. I'll just roll with technical issues. Um, so after creating the video, we decided to uh, interview our peers as a focus group. Uh, it was a discussion-based group, and we asked them to uh, analyze what they thought of the content, the style of the video, the animations, uh, and overall uh, style of the video. Uh, we also decided to ask them what they thought of the trustworthiness of internet videos in general, to see if there were any stigmas to representing our video and BIPA's information overall as an internet or a YouTube video represented on Facebook or YouTube. And uh, we used the feedback we got from them as well as interviews we had performed previously uh, while in the States with expert interviews with um, Elaine Sanfilippo and uh, Dr. Ben Sharifa, uh, as well as discussion we had done within BIPA to uh, create a series of recommendations. As John mentioned, we took all of our research, our interviews, and our focus group data to create a series of recommendations. And we split these into two categories, those dealing with the overall production process and those dealing with the content of each video, both in terms of topics covered and artistic style. So beginning with the process recommendations, the first thing we recommend is that moving forward, MIPA utilizes students with some sort of graphic design or art background when creating these videos. We all we love the opportunity to get to be creative and use new tools and softwares. As you can see, they're fairly complex, and even animating one scene can take several hours or days, um, which in a span of only seven weeks really cut down a lot of our time. Using students who have a background in this would really uh, allow for a more content creation time given the same time span. Um, in terms of content, uh, our main content recommendation is to answer the so what question. If a viewer comes across this video, what should they care about? What should they do next? So what? So during our focus group, several uh, respondents noted that while they were very interested in the trust index following the video, they really didn't know what they were supposed to do next. They didn't know how they could fix it. They didn't know where they could gain more information, anything like that. Um, because of this, we recommend that future videos meet the institutes uh, implements a further reading section or a further information section as well as possibly um, offering within the video a solution as well as the end of the future videos. We would like to thank our advisors, Professor Laura Roberts and Professor, Professor Mohamed El Hamzawi, for their invaluable advice and support, as well as our sponsor, Dr. Mohamed Mazba, for his time and guidance. We would also like to thank Professor Rebecca Moody and Dr. 
Dr. Abdulik Bentrifa and Emily San Filippo for their expertise and time. Lastly, we would like to thank Professor Sahar Al Korchi and Mohamed Brahimi for establishing this project and experience for our group. And we would like to leave for the court. Freedom is hammered out on the anvil of discussion, debate, and dissent. The first step towards creating change is recognizing the problem and creating a discussion, which is exactly what MIPA aims to do. Shokan, does anyone have any questions? Sustainable Hamams Group here to present our final presentation. Um, before we start presenting, we're going to introduce our group. Oh. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Peyton. I'm Rebecca. I'm Nathan. And I'm Brian. Uh, now Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> and now Peyton is going to talk about our background. So, climate change is one of the most pressing issues in the modern global landscape. It's happening right now, and it threatens the way of life of people all around the world. In recent years, scientists have recorded extreme temperatures and even more frequent extreme weather events than ever before as a result of climate change. Um, the rising global average temperature also has led to rising sea levels, loss of biodiversity, and lower agricultural yields. With a problem as big as climate change is, it seems almost impossible to find a solution that can encompass everything we need to account for. Luckily though, there are small actions being taken by people in areas all around the world, and we believe that these small actions have the potential to make a bigger impact. In Morocco, the rising average temperatures, combined with um, a history of poor resource management, has led to a number of environmental issues. And one of the main contributors to this problem is cultural institutions cemented in tradition, such as the hammam. So what is a hammam? Um, the hammam is the traditional Moroccan public bathhouse. There's one in every Moroccan neighborhood, and it serves as a cultural cornerstone, providing services not only for the physical act of cleaning, but also for social interaction and religious purposes. It used to be that a lot of Moroccan homes didn't have access to running water, so families would visit the hammam for sanitary reasons. 
But even today, many Moroccans visit the Hammam at least once a week, especially on Thursdays or Friday mornings to cleanse themselves before prayer. With all of this information being known, it is clear that um, the Hammam plays an important role in Moroccan culture that we wouldn't want to change. But there are also a lot of environmental impacts of Hammams that we must consider in order to create a more sustainable future. So to cover the problem that we see with Moroccan moms and the environmental impact right now, we want to start with deforestation. So in order to heat the water and steam necessary for the bathing ritual, moms use a staggering amount of wood every single day. Um, and this wood is harvested from forests in the surrounding regions, which contributes to the growing problem of deforestation in Morocco. This loss of trees combined with the um, destruction of natural landscape also contributes to soil degradation and desertification. Um, air pollution is also a problem as the emissions from Hamam smokestacks release CO2 into the air that contribute to the diminishing ozone layer. Particulate matter released from the smoke also creates health risks for Hamam employees and surrounding communities as it can trigger respiratory infections and trigger asthma. Moving on to the issue of water, Morocco is considered a water-scarce country, and especially in recent years, they've suffered from crippling droughts. Hamams use an, amount, an enormous amount of water every single day, and this depletes water resources that are necessary for a lot of institutions. The wastewater from Hamams also can pollute the groundwater because it can be filled with bacteria and chemicals from soaps and shampoos used during bathing. And finally, inefficient lighting inside the hammams contributes to energy waste and also increased electricity costs for hammam owners. With all of these environmental impacts taken into account, it is clear that a change needs to be made. And luckily, um, organizations such as Association of Guadalajara have already started taking small steps to find a solution. So, Association of Bottle Thought is a Moroccan NGO based in Rabat. Their goal is to promote sustainable living and environmental learning while fostering Moroccan culture and heritage. They've partnered with Dr. Hadija Kadiri to help combat the climate issues in Hamams. And now Rebecca is going to talk about our methodology. Um, so the goal of our project was to work with the association uh, with Bottle Thought to implement and create a more sustainable, eco-friendly plan for maintaining um, Hamam systems. So previously before coming here, we had just kind of assumed that it would include the heating systems, but while working with our sponsor, we were realizing that there's more to just that. Um, the, the water and the lighting systems are also very important, so our goal has changed and broadened to include those as well as the heating systems. So to complete this goal, we worked through three objectives, um, the first of which was very essential to understand and comprehend the importance of how a hammam functions, both inside and out. Um, so we had to do this through um, learning about the financials and just how it was run. Um, this was able to be done partially through our archival research before getting to Morocco, um, but more so of it was done through the semi-structured interviews that we conducted, where we were actually able to talk to those who ran and operated the homes. Um, we then used this data in our interviews to synthesize a um, economic balance and an environmental energy balance um, that we used to deliver our, um, <laughs> we delivered our recommendations to the Association of Bottle Fob on how to make more sustainable systems for the animals. Brian is going to now talk about how we did this through our findings and analysis. So our primary findings in were split into three categories, fuel, boiler, and feeder findings. And so we're going to start with fuel findings. So, many Hamam owners described wood as a very dirty and inefficient fuel source. For every 10 kilograms of wood burned, it produced a kilogram of ash. The buildup of ash can affect the performance of the equipment and also adds another expense for Hamam owners to dispose of. Wood is also very inefficient because um, it is sold by weight and so 
it's often very wet and dirty in the market. And when and only about 60% of what homeowners pay for is actually burned as fuel. And so as you can see in the graph, a traditional furnace fueled by wood is only 41% efficient. And by simply making a switch to biomass fuels, the efficiency is 1.3 times as efficient, leading to an annual fuel savings of 60,000 dirham. So in terms of boilers, um, traditional furnaces are made of clay and they have, tend to deteriorate over time. And so this leads to cracks and holes in the clay, which increase their already high ambient um, heat loss, lowering the system efficiency. On the contrary, modern boilers are very well insulated, and so they are 16% more efficient than the traditional counterparts. And as you can see from the graph, the higher efficiency leads to an annual fuel savings of 24,000 dirham. And finally, the feeder. A feeder is a mechanism that distributes fuel directly to the center of the fire. This eliminates the need for an employee to open the door to the boiler or furnace, mitigating the heat loss. Because of the, a feeder can be installed on both a traditional furnace and a modern boiler. And both systems, it increases the overall efficiency by 10%. This leads to an annual fuel saving of 9,000 dirham. And so based on these findings, uh, we developed the following recommendations. So the easiest recommendation for us to make was pretty clear, and that was to switch from traditional wood used as fuel to a biomass. Um, now while we have pictured here the argon shells, um, there's other options in Morocco such as olive pomace, and regardless of which biomass you choose to use, um, it's very easy to implement in any hammam because it will actually just save you money off the bat as it's more efficient. Um, it's cost efficient as well, and it's just going to get rid of um, like ash and smoke produced, which helps both of these.